and then from those facts, yeah. then the jury can make their make decision that whether it's emotional or not. Whether right. That's what they consider is reasonable care yeah. or not. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And of course, the standard in a criminal action will be different. Mm -hmm. Right. We talked about that as well. Yeah. Here we have beyond a reasonable doubt of a criminal act. Here, where there just simply needs to be a preponderance of the evidence. So, um, so it, it's essentially harder to prove a criminal case and easier to prove a civil case is kind of the, the quick and dirty version of that. Okay. Um, but it's an interesting scenario, absolutely. It's a, it's a very interesting, it's an interesting scenario. And, and also the jury probably played into, I don't know, if pro or con of it, his age. He was you know, 17. 17 right. And not being an experienced driver or if that was a good thing or, or that was a bad thing, they looked at it as a bad thing by not being an experienced driver. You know, age, Really Absolutely, it's a big part of okay, the and teenage and boys. We always think they're going to be a little reckless. And so see, and here's where our own personal experiences right. and perceptions yes, right. and biases mm -hmm. that we have really can play a very significant role. Right. You said, I know how 17 year old boys act. Mm -hmm. right. That's a bias of right. course right. that you have that a 17 year old male driver is going to act in a particular way. Mm -hmm. And not until my daughter got older, I always felt, and probably for myself personally, when I was 16, I felt like the driving age should have been good. A 16-year-old me thought maybe the driving age should have been 14. But now a 43-year-old me feels like the driving age should be 25. Yes, you know? exactly. So, I agree. Right, right, exactly. And that could play a part right. as well as, you know. So the 20-year-old you right. might okay. have looked at that case very differently than the 40-year-old you. Right, definitely. Because your life has changed. Correct. You've had a child. Right. You've had more life experience. Right. But Different things like that have happened. Time, and that's affected the older your person might look at it as in, but the kid was 17. Right. Where are we going to go? Put him in jail. You put a 17 year old boy in jail. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. right. right. So, Y'all, this, right. everything that, that just has happened happened right here, all of this beautiful right. conversation mm -hmm. is the beauty of our judicial system. Right. It's the beauty of our legal system that you guys can look at the same exact scenario that I just gave you and have varying different viewpoints. It's also why jury verdicts are so terribly difficult to predict because will I have nine of you in a box or will right. I have nine of you in a box or will I have five and four and how is that going to go? Right. 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 Okay. So so that's so uh, that's what I that's what I love about doing this session because I think you get to see it sort of unfold. Unfold in real life. Right. All right. So let's talk about apportionment of fault. Um, Hoffman versus Jones. Tell me really quickly, how did y'all, what did y'all think of that assignment? Didn't like it. I thought it was right or true. Or false. <laughs> now, that last you've been in this class long that enough to know that one. there are shades of gray. <laughs> no black and white. <laughs> right, right. There are shades of gray. Question. I was like, okay, she said true or false. <laughs> it's not it. <laughs> no, no. Right? What I was looking for in that answer was a true understanding of separation of powers. Right. More than anything else. To understand. And I didn't care. Truly, I did not care whether you told me that you think the court was completely wrong and that the legislature should have enacted comparative fault and that was the responsibility of the legislature to do it or if you think the court was right to step in and take action and to um, provide a more just result with a, a schematic of comparative fault instead of, of contributory negligence. What I cared about was how you supported your answer. Doesn't matter, you know. Opinion doesn't matter, <laughs> I don't mean to say that constantly. You know, you're entitled to your own opinion and analysis about which it is. What I was more concerned about was how did you support your response, okay? but. But that's an example of, again, of separation of powers, the different responsibilities of the branches, and the real life application of an actual case. That case is a perfect example of the struggle between the courts and the legislature and how that affects laws that affect us, which is why I um, signed it. <laughs> so, so did the legislature eventually change the law after the case? So interestingly, um, comparative fault. So Hoffman versus Jones sort of opened the door, basically, in establishing comparative fault as 
the schematic for um, for when both parties are at fault. In my opinion, I think the Florida legislature fully embraced the Hoffman decision because they, in this year subsequent to that, have enacted many different statutes that have codified comparative fault and expanded comparative fault to a variety of different situations, far more than just auto negligence. So you might be able to make the argument that the Florida Supreme Court gave the legislature the necessary kick in the pants, right? You know, kind of the kick in the pants that they needed. And I said, you know, the legislature's basically saying, all right, you know, the courts interpreted it this way. And then over time, they, they really did embrace it and actually expanded the principles of comparative fault um, in, in many different ways. So I would say, I would say that yes, they have very much embraced it. Okay, so. We know that we can have a plaintiff versus a defendant in an action. Like you learned from the Hoffman versus Jones case, what the jury will do is they will look at a particular scenario and determine what parties are at fault and to what percent they are at fault. So let's say that, um, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll use an I-75 scenario. Let's say that there's an SUV driven, uh, no. Plaintiff is an SUV driver on I-75. Defendant rear ended the SUV driver on I 75, causing significant damage, both damage to the vehicle and um, injuries to the plaintiff driver and their occupants. Let's say that, for sake of argument, the jury found that the plaintiff suffered $1 million worth of damages, pain and suffering damages, um, medical expenses, property damage to the vehicle. Let's say that the jury found that the defendant rear-ended the SUV driver because there was evidence showing that they were texting while that they were driving. Okay, then let us say that the jury also found that the back taillights on the SUV were not up. It was that this accident occurred at night and the taillight on the SUV was out. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, what percentage of fault do you attribute to the plaintiff SUV driver? What percentage of fault do you attribute to the texting driver defendant? Throw out some numbers. Yes, ma'am. Oh, did you, you didn't have your hand Oh, oh well, yeah. your pencil on. Yeah. All right. I'll say if his lights weren't out, he probably would have saw him. But if he wasn't texting, he would have saw him too. No. If he get rear-ended, that's that person's fault. But if he can't see you if your lights out. See? See, guys? This is what happens in jury rooms. <laughs> <laughs> that's what happens in jury rooms. Yeah, but when I'm you're jury. texting, you can't see anyone. Right. But the lights, you know, <laughs> I mean, when you text, you got to be, be rich. When you text, you look up and drive. I'm not going to say I do it, but I'm going to do it. You as you're speeding up. Yeah, but you, <laughs> you see, you, you look up. Oh, you, you drive on the highway. You drive back home and stuff. I'm saying like, like 30% right. for the SUV and 70% for the text driver. Okay. Ooh. All right. What do you think? Oh, so he wants to give 70% to a fault on the rear he don't deserve a million dollars worth of pain and suffering because you could have paid eight dollars to get that light fixed. So you <laughs> but you could be ignorant of the fact that that lights out. A lot yeah, of that's people what don't I was know. The last you know. class that I attended, I got stopped on the road right after leaving because my tag light was out. And you didn't know. And you didn't of know. Of course I didn't know. You don't stand behind your car. 
with your foot on the brake. Tell me how you can do that. Right. Exactly. Okay. That's a reasonable person. <laughs> Would a reasonable driver on a periodic basis go and check their lights on their vehicle? I'm sure your driver's license no. handbook tells you you're supposed to. Yeah, she she oh, really? To. Oh, I'm sure it says you're supposed oh. to. I don't do it. Yeah, I know I don't do it. I can't even think of the last one. That's why I didn't get ticketed. The cop was like, nobody knows. Nobody yeah. asked. Should you know? You should. Do you have a legal responsibility as Legally, an operator yes, of a vehicle to make sure that your vehicle is in safe operating condition? Yes. Yes, yes, yes you do. But, okay, anybody can say they didn't know. I'm not saying you did. Well, I'm saying anybody can say they didn't know. People ride around knowing their lights are out. I know college kids do this for a while. Mm -hmm. We'll drive, get home before it gets dark, just so they won't get pulled over. Right. And guys, it's a five dollar light bulb. Right. You know, get your light bulb. Right. Okay. The beauty again of our system is that we can hear the same set of facts and have very different perceptions. Mm -hmm. Right. We're gonna go with your numbers though, because you gave me some. Nobody else is giving. Me that. <laughs> I like that. Those are good numbers. All right, I you like the numbers? Good. I okay, agree. that's good. So we're gonna Just give them. We're gonna give them thirty percent. All right. So, how much is that SUV driver receiving? Seven three. Yeah. The SUV drivers' verdict will be reduced by their percentage of fault. Correct. Exactly. So the SUV driver will receive. One million dollars. Excuse me, no, seven hundred thousand dollars, right? Seven hundred thousand. Less, less attorneys' fees. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> yes, less attorneys' fees. <laughs> Which, by the way, yeah, can be as yeah. high as forty percent for a. Um, then there are Case it goes all the way to jury. Isn't there a law about that? About how much? Isn't that what yeah. Chestnut got in trouble for? Yes. Yes, um, I, I don't. I only remember reading something. There are the Florida bar does have caps on the amount of attorneys' fees, and once a case goes to trial, the cap goes up. They can get more in attorneys' fees um, because, of course, going to trial is more expensive and more risky. So, in a contingency fee scenario, attorneys are essentially rewarded a little bit more um, for for bringing a case to trial. I think the issue where he got in trouble with is he actually had a chance to settle that case pre-trial. I, I can't. Re I, I don't. I don't want to guess and be wrong. But yes, there are limits on the percentage of attorneys' fees well, that can be recovered. Yes. How is it? I was involved in a lawsuit that, that we won. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I was I was the plaintiff and. The defendants, we tried and tried to make settlements, and they were told, even the judge told them, you know, you're not going to win, basically. Yeah. I live in a very small town. Mm -hmm. And they lost, and they had to pay our attorneys. Yes. Which were very expensive because of all the, the stupid stuff that they did. That can happen for a variety of different reasons. Um, not knowing the specifics of your scenarios, I'll just hit this really quick, but this, this is interesting. There can indeed be what are known as fee-shifting provisions, which means that the person who loses the case can be required to pay the other party's uh, attorney's fees. Scenarios where that occur, one is with perhaps there's a, a contractual provision. Very common in business, in, in, in contracts that you know, businesses might be engaging in. They say that the, the the party who loses will be responsible for the other party's attorney's fees. Okay, so there could have been a contractual provision. Mm -hmm. There might not have been. Okay. There can also be what is known as, and this is this is getting deeper, but it is sort of interesting because most cases actually um, involve this. What is known as a proposal for settlement, which is a formalized document, a formalized settlement offer, which can be made by one party to another, and if this settlement offer is made in writing in a specific statutory proposal for settlement form. They have a certain number of days to accept that offer. If they do not accept that offer and then a verdict is rendered at a certain percentage above or below the offer, mm -hmm. they can be required to pay attorney's fees in that scenario. Yeah, they actually have to pay all of them. Yeah, yeah, okay. So the proposal for settlement mechanism can end up 
makes trial a lot more risky because not only might you lose and have to pay, but you might also have to pay attorney's fees as well. Proposals for settlement really, really make parties think hard. That's about I hear a lot of them settling out of court. 98% of the cases yeah. that are filed in our judicial system settle prior to trial. That's what I do mm -hmm. okay. as a mediator. Mm -hmm. Work on settling cases prior to trial. One, because it's less expensive, mm -hmm. and two, it's less risky. Mm -hmm. At the end of a mediation conference, all the parties, so this is jumping up to litigation process, but you all need to know this too. Mediation is a voluntary you can be required to go to mediation, of course. But I, as a mediator, don't tell people you have to pay X amount. Mm -hmm. We work through a settlement process, like work through a negotiation process. But when you walk out of a mediation conference, if you've come to a settlement, everybody knows what they're paying. Right. Everybody knows what they're receiving. They've come to an agreement about that. Versus at trial, right. as yeah. we have discovered from our ladies and gentlemen of the jury tonight, we don't know how it's going to go. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows how it's going to go. Nobody knows with any level of certainty what those nine people in that box are going to do. There's great risk and potential uncertainty in trial. So that's why I think mediation, um, an awful lot of cases are mediated because, again, it gives, it gives a little bit more certainty. Okay, so we know that our SUV driver is going to receive $1 million, excuse me, $700,000 in damages. Um, interestingly, I'll make this very quick, but I want to discuss the concept of bad ray defendants very quickly. If we find out that, let me think about this for a second. Let's say that our rear ender wasn't texting, but rear ended this individual because a Corvette driver, we'll call him C, weaving in and out of traffic at a high rate of speed. Yeah. Defendant rear ender had to swerve out of the way of this vehicle. And, you know, maybe we can say they're still texting, okay? But we know that this other driver affected what happened and them having to make evasive maneuvers. This Corvette driver was never found off the scene, no license plate, nothing. But there are witnesses who said, yeah, we saw this Corvette driver weaving in and out of traffic. We saw the defendant had to make some evasive maneuvers and probably ended up rear-ending the person ahead of them because of the scenario they were in and trying to evade or, you know, uh, 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 evade the traffic pattern created by the Corvette driver. Do you know what the jury can do in this scenario? This is what is known as a phantom party. Why? They're not sitting in the courtroom. They can't be sued. We don't have any funds. The jury can still apportion fault to our phantom driver. How much money? All right, so now we got to change our numbers a little bit. How much fault, jury, are you going to portion to our phantom driver? How much was this high rate of speed, weaving in and out of traffic jerk responsible for what happened that night? Well, he was, was pretty responsible. responsible. Yeah, I'm going to say like 80%. 90. Yeah, like, well, yeah but you're oh, still dealing with somebody. But keep in mind, we still have We still have an out tail light. You're still dealing with somebody texting. We still deal with somebody texting, and we have. I'm saying, okay, obviously he wasn't texting if he was trying to swerve out of the way. He was aware of what he was doing. He was trying not to. Okay. Was he fully aware? Would he have been more aware if he wasn't texting at all? I'm trying to get my written out of that. Would you? Would you? Would your reaction time have been quicker had you not had that phone in your hand while oh, you were texting? You would. He he's still at fault, but I still don't think he's seventy percent. Okay. No. At okay. Fault. Because give, give, give me numbers. Texting, give, give me numbers. You're texting, and you happen to notice Corvette coming up behind you, swerving in and out, and you have to make a decision. 
you're not gonna text, look in your mirror, and go back to texting and be like, oh, let me move over. You're gonna stop texting for that minute. And look and see what you're doing. Maybe he was texting 911. <laughs> to report, to report the fact.